All right. Appropriately, we're discussing the digestive system. And I trust you all digested well over the holidays and enjoyed this. So let's continue with the second largest gland, the pancreas. What was the first largest gland? I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for him. <laughs> Liver, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, the second largest gland. This gland then has two main types of cells, the exocrine and endocrine. And the exocrine cells are called acinar cells. Acinar cells. And they secrete enzymes which go into ducts. Secrete enzymes into ducts. And the ducts eventually converge into a duct which joins the bile duct. And this duct then liberates the contents into the duodenum. Pancreatic enzymes would be examples chymotrypsin and chym and no trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen and trypsinogen. Then the endocrine cells are called the islets of Langerhan. And these islets then are scattered in little groups. amongst the acinar cells. By far, the greatest number of cells are acinar cells. Then islets. There are more islets in the tail of the pancreas than in other parts of the pancreas. We may have mentioned previously the location of the pancreas, so you can see where the tail is. If we have the stomach coming in, Do you know what's causing that? 
No. This is our stomach. This is our pyloric sphincter. So that makes this what? Duodenum. And we'll find that the pancreas then, gonna switch with me? Thank you. Check one, two, three, four. Check one, two, three, four. All right, we'll see how that is. <laughs> Hope it's a little quieter for you. Thank you very much. So we want to put then the pancreas in between the stomach and the duodenum here. Give it a little more of a tail. So in yellow, we have our pancreas. which will then have a head, a neck, a body, and a tail. So head, neck, body, and tail. And we said most of the islet cells are down in the tail. So the islet cells are of different types. We have alpha cells, beta cells, and delta cells. And each secretes a different, whoops, a different hormone. The alpha cells secrete what? Glucagon. And that will raise blood sugar. The beta cells, insulin, which will lower blood sugar. And the delta cells, somatostatin. Somatostatin. Which will inhibit other pancreatic hormones. Anybody know anyone who's had pancreatic cancer? How are they doing? They died, yes. Used to be within a year after you hear from pancreatic cancer that they died, but I've been told now they're having greater success to carry them through. So if you have somebody, tell them that there are some positive outlooks. But it used to, we just all dreaded getting pancreatic cancer. All right, with that small introduction to the pancreas, let's move on to the kidney. Let's just call it the urinary system to start with. That's better. So our urinary system is designed then to form urine and excrete urine. So we need several structures involved here. We're going to have two kidneys 
and they will be involved in forming urine and we'll have two ureters that will excrete, let's put just pass urine. We'll have one urinary bladder. So now after taking anatomy, you know you have to, when you say bladder, classify whether it's urinary or gall. And this will store, some people say, and concentrate urine. I've seen it in some books, not in others. And then one urethra. And the urethra then will convey the urine to the exterior. So let's take our kidneys first then and see how they form urine. First, what's the size of a kidney? Between four and five inches long, two to three inches wide, and one inch thick. These will vary. Did I tell you when we were teaching in Venezuela, they thought we were urologists and not neurologists, and they took us into a room filled with urologists. And I looked at my husband, he looked at me, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I'll ask him a simple question. What's the difference between the right and left kidney? Guess what we discussed? They'd never thought of it. Does it make a difference when you transplant? They had never thought of it. A kidney was a kidney. <laughs> we gave them lots to think about. We were completely ignorant, <laughs> other than what I know in my basic anatomy. Anyhow, so it shows you what, you've got a lot of adrenaline. You can bring things out rapidly. And I can tell you lots of stories that way, but I won't. We'll continue on why we learn about kidneys. Then we want the location of the kidney. It's going to be on our posterior abdominal wall. Posterior abdominal wall. And it will be posterior to the parietal peritoneum. Posterior to parietal peritoneum, which lines the abdominal wall, but it's posterior to parietal peritoneum. So it's called retroperitoneal. Retroperitoneal. Important to know what structures are retroperitoneal. So if they are producing something abnormal, it won't go into the peritoneal cavity, it's retroperitoneal. Now, how do we define where it is on this posterior abdominal wall? It'll make a difference whether it's the left or the right kidney. The left kidney is, this is left kidney. It's going to be between T12, L1, L2, L3. So we'll have the upper pole up here at T12 and the lower pole down at L3.
Now, do you think the right kidney is going to be higher or lower? And defend your answer. No idea. It's going to be lower because we have the right lobe of the liver over here. So it has to be lower to be below the liver. We don't have the, right, oh, the big lobe on the left side. So the right kidney is lower than left because of large right lobe of liver. So that's location, that's size. Now let's begin to look at structure. First we'll look at external structure. define the shape of a kidney to somebody, you say it's bean-shaped. When you define a bean to somebody, you say it's kidney-shaped. But we know what you're talking about. So it's bean-shaped. The indentation is called the hilus. And in the hilus, we'll have the renal artery coming in. Where's the renal artery coming from? Thank you. Perfect. We learned that again, the importance of knowing that relationship when we learned about the abdominal aorta in Monty Paxton's lecture on the vascular surgery. Then we have the renal vein entering at the hilus. And I'll have to sort of overlay it, or maybe what I'll do is make another one. We'll have the renal pelvis. What's pelvis mean? Basin. Here we have the renal pelvis coming out. And it will continue into the ureter. So that gives us some basic landmarks. One more. Let's, no, let's go internal. This is just internal. We'll have the cortex. And the medulla. What does cortex mean? Bark. Good for you. That was quick. Now, we're going to look at the internal tubal tubular structure. We're going to kidney is just masses of tubules. We have those which are secretory. and those which are excretory. The 
secretory will consist of want to be sure I give you the special name that I don't mix it up here. Secretory will begin will be the nephron. And the nephron is the structural and functional unit of the kidney. What's the structural and functional unit of the liver? La labial. <laughs> How about compact bone? <laughs> We've learned them, haven't we? And muscle? All right. So now, what's the nephron consist of? have the secretory component and it will have the Bowman's capsule I hope you corrected one of the students saw it was misspelled up there I didn't write clearly when I turned that in today to be typed, so I apologize. So it should have been Bowman's capsule. Bowman's capsule and glomerulus. And this is called the renal corpuscle. And we then have the renal tubules. And these will be the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal convoluted tubule. The loop of Henle. Have you ever known a Mr. Henley? They do have rare names, don't they? Distal convoluted tubule. And these are our renal tubules. And these then all make up our nephron. Our unit. So we'll start, put some functional significance into this group of tubules. Ever thought about how many structures in your body are tubules? How many of our systems? We had the respiratory, we had the digestive, we had the nervous. Now we're getting our urinary, all tubules. So, we're going to start with our Bowman's capsule. It's going to have two layers. Now, we want to leave lots of room because we've got to go down, we've got to go wide, and we've got to go up. So we're going to put the capsule right in about here. We have an outer layer. Outer. What are you going to call the outer layer? Ooh, that should be so fast. 
parietal, right? Parietal. Parietal layer of Bowman's capsule will be one, and it will consist of simple squamous epithelium. And an inner layer What are you going to call the inner layer? Visceral, right. Visceral layer of Bowman's capsule. I'm just not going to write it out. It's a visceral layer. And the visceral layer consists of what are called podocytes. Podocytes, foot cells. And these are to allow for filtration. It's hard to draw them, but you get the sort of general idea that you have a cell with little foot processes. And these foot processes sit on the basement membrane. So that filtration can come through these openings between the foot processes for filtrate. So with this, I want to introduce the term glomerulus, which is the other component of the nephron in this region. The glomerulus now, we're not going to go through all the arteries which lead to it, but our purpose in forming a nephron, as we said, was to filter plasma make a glomerular filtrate which will eventually form urine. So we have to have the structures that will carry these functions out. So we've got to bring the blood supply into our Bowman's capsule. It'll be coming in as an afferent arteriole. Now leave room here because we've got to bring other things above it. This will be, we'll call it three here. Move it over. Three equals an afferent arteriole. Bringing in arterial blood. It's going to break up into a massive capillary bed that comes right against our podocytes in our visceral layer. And this will be four. Four will be the glomerulus. So that's a capillary bed. which will be bringing in arterial blood. And then after the filtrate has been formed, the blood continues on as the efferent arter arterial, E for exit. Five is our efferent arterial.
so now our purpose is to form a filtrate that's going to start collecting in this series of ducts that we want to develop. So for blood to form a glomerular filtrate, the plasma will go through. We go from the capillary endothelium and through the podocyte then through the basement membrane and then we will have glomerular filtrate you think is the most important structure here to be getting our glomerular filtrate? Basement membrane. The basement membrane will not allow molecules over 70,000 with a molecular weight. Molecules with molecular weight over 70,000 not pass basement membrane. How would you like the job in the lab of isolating the basement membrane? They were doing this in Copenhagen back in the 60s. Tremendous progress since then. All right. All right. Now we formed our filtrate. We want to continue on with our picture. To see what happens to get us some urine. But in order to do this, let's find out how much blood goes through the kidneys each minute. Well, it said 1,200 cc's blood. Out of that, 125 cc's of glomerular filtrate. And out of that, 124 cc's of glomerular, glomerular filtrate are reabsorbed. So how much urine do we get? One cc. You think you could design a kidney more efficient? What have we got? 1,200 cc's of blood is needed to extract one cc of urine. This is 125 cc's of filtrate per minute. Picture your kidneys. Do you see them there? Never, never think about them. Just get mad if they don't work. Or if they work too efficiently after a beer party. <laughs> And here we are, 124 reabsorbed. You guessed it. That's the end product. 
Isn't that amazing? Yeah, we've got this for later. But I think that's pretty dramatic to have a gland functioning in one minute for that kind of processing in your body. And you've never, ever thought of it before. All right, now we've got to follow to see what's happening, where this glomerular filtrate is coming down now. See, we've made our filtrate. It's got to go through our tubular system. So we first encounter the, we're going to draw it and then come back and speak about it, all right? We're going into the proximal convoluted tubule. We're just going to make one convolution here, even though there are hundreds, as a representative sample. This will be my proximal convoluted tubule. This will be our loop of Henle. the descending limb. And now we'll go back up with the ascending limb. Ascending limb. And it will come all the way up. Now, this is why I asked you to keep space up here. That was our afferent arteriole. Got to take it off at the moment. Take it all the way up. All the way up. Clear around. because I want this to come around and out and I want it to be the this one should be the I want an inner coming in <laughs> like this So that makes our distal convoluted tubule. It gets us through our nephron. So now, what's happening? What is our, why do we need these? And what are the differences between or amongst them? So let's take our proximal convoluted tubule. Most of your cortex consists of proximal convoluted tubule. So it will be lined with cuboidal cells. With a brush border. Just looked like a brush when early with the light microscope. With the electron microscope, they learned that the brush border is actually microvilli. So, as we had in the intestine, increasing surface area by having microvilli. show pictures of these. They're very distinct. Now, the, what's the function here of my posterior convoluted? By, did I say post? Proc, proximal should be proximal convoluted tubule. 
Number one, it's going to absorb 100 cc's of water. It's going to absorb any glucose that comes in. It will absorb amino acids. You don't want protein in your urine. Amino acids. It will absorb sodium ion. and vitamin C. Tremendous reabsorption going on in all of those proximal convoluted tubules. How about the loop of Henle? The descending limb will be reabsorbing water. The ascending limb will reabsorb sodium ion and chloride. Now what's left for the distal convoluted tubule? We'll have water, we'll have calcium ion, we'll have phosphate, and sodium. But something different is happening in the distal convoluted tubule rather than just absorption. We'll have secretion. This is absorption with all of these. And then there'll be secretion. What's being secreted? Hydrogen ion and potassium ion. Hydrogen ion and potassium. So tremendous ion exchange going on within your kidneys. But now, say that you have low blood pressure and you have low sodium. Did he click? Yes, okay, well then I'll give this next time because I want you to see the slides while it's fresh with this. First slide, please. Thank you. This is just to show the position of the pancreas here, with the head would be over further, a little bit distorted. You'll learn all about the omentum and all these membranes when you take advanced anatomy. But this is, the head would be here in the body, here in the tail, here, neck in between. In the next one, now this is a very special stain, malariazon, and it shows these are acinar cells. With this particular stain, you can truly pick up the islets of Langerhan in the pancreas. But this is a rare, rare stain. What you'll usually get in pathology is the next one. Next slide. Now where do you see? Here are islets here. These are acinar stains. This is with an iron, hematoxylin, and aniline blue stain, entirely different, but showing what staining can do to demonstrate structure. In the next one, 
And now we're in the cortex of the kidney. It has a connective tissue membrane, a good thick protective one. Here's our glomerulus in the Bowman's capsule. This would be the parietal layer. The visceral layer is adherent to the capillaries in the form of podocytes. Now most of these are proximal convoluted tubules. In the next one, now this is showing the blood supply coming in, the interlobar arteries, the arcuate arteries, then an interlobular artery comes on up and gives off the glomeruli via the afferent arteriole. But you can see this is the glomerulus. In the next one, and this is with an India ink injection into the vascular supply. So you can see the main trunks coming up, the interlobular ones, and then the afferent coming in. Not all of them will have both because this is a big ball, and just you'll get a section which will show both. In next, next please. Now this is the Bowman's capsule to show you it truly is just a simple squamous capsule. This is the area between the parietal layer and the visceral layer, which is adherent to the capillaries bed here. And you're going to be collecting the filtrate in here in the next one. And this shows, this is just a normal uh, iron, let's see, this is hematoxyl and eosin stain. You have the parietal layer, then the visceral layer adherent again to the endothelium. In the next one. Now we have here an afferent arteriole coming in. This is a rare one. And the efferent, is it, no, it's going to be coming out over here. No, what is this? That's the beginning of the uh, tubular system. So it's difficult to determine which is afferent and which is efferent here. But on the slide it says it shows both afferent and efferent, so it has to be one of these, and this would be your tubular system collecting the glomerular filtrate. That's a rare slide. I've never seen one like this before. In the next one, and this now shows cross-sections of your proximal convoluted tubule. You see the blue? That's your brush border. That's the way it looks with a light micrograph. But it's in reality microvilli for absorption. 100 cc's has to come back in of water in this proximal convoluted tubule. In the next one, and here's another different stain to show how marked, but you can see why early anatomists called it a brush border. In the next one, and now what's this? Hmm? Pardon? Everybody should know that. What is it? I'll wait until you say. Where does the filtrate go as it leaves the proximal convoluted tubule? Into the loop of Henle. See, isn't that a beautiful loop? Have you ever seen a slide like that that actually catches it amongst all these tubules? So that's the loop of Henle. The layer going down is thinner than the layer coming back up. In the next one, and this is now going to be one of the collecting ducts, because after the urine leaves the nephron, it enters collecting ducts. In the next one, and these are collecting ducts in cross-section. So you see, this would be loops of Henley down here in cross-section, but the big ones are now collecting ducts. In the next one, that's it. All right, enjoy your afternoon.